The attention span right now is three. About three and a half, four minutes. She got to be moving. Bang, 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 bang. That's how it is totally changed right now. Final, if you paid $8 for a record, <laughs> you was going to spend a little bit more time on it than it is now. Then you just do an MP3, which you downloaded one and then you just doubled it for two of them to match it from the equipment. So let's get into it. My name's John Dennis. I'm okay. originally from St. Louis. Uh -huh. I started off probably spinning records, uh, actually when I was in the Air Force. Um, I actually started, it was uh, me and a good friend of mine, Ron Pullman, who's real popular here in Atlanta. Uh, we started, uh, we always like to think of it as 1009 Runberg. It was in Austin, Texas. I was stationed at uh, Bergstrom's Air Force Base. That's where I would say I really had a foundation of music. Probably one of my biggest mentors was a guy named Philip Dickerson. Wow, throwback. I know I knew Philip. Yeah, go all the way back from Philadelphia. And he used to spin at a club at Smarts, and he used to always kind of mentor and kind of tell me what was going on and what was happening, what was new and hot. And that was back when long distance cost. <laughs> so that gives you an idea of how important and the value that we had it then. Then after I left the Air Force, I went back home to St. Louis. And I started spinning records at a club called the Zebra Lounge. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very instrumental back there in that time because that was a time when clubs really did offer the freedom in the house. It was really a great time because you could really feel the, mi the mix and the music. And there was a heavier, strong, and house tend to bring more of a community. That's what it really is, I would have to say, the single most me method that I would say that house is did it brought community and you can always hear people from the paradise garage to the catch one la which i always like to say that's what we have in indigenous house we go from the paradise to the catch because those were usually the incubators of safe zones for a lot of lgbt people during that time mm -hmm. let's go well, let's get right into Indigenous House, and then we'll work backwards. Okay, that's fine. Tell people, well, what is Indigenous House? Indigenous House is the original house, people. The main reason why I started Indigenous House, because I've been in house parties from Berlin to Tokyo, and a lot of those parties are great. Mind you, I mean, they're really great. I've been in London at 51st Street and Louis dropped it down, but I noticed that they just don't feel the music like the original house people do. It's not the same. It's not the same. We can appreciate them, we can respect them, but you just cannot say it's just not the freedom and the energy. It's just, it's just lacking. Some of the times I've been in Europe, I said, God damn it, I think I'm in a Catholic church. <laughs> that the music was just left. I think they really missing out on this here. I'm like, I just can't see it. You know, but if you get to some of the authentic clubs like in New York or Washington or Atlanta or even Chicago, you'll even feel that there's a different community and energy on the spot. But what's different and unique about Indigenous House, I find, from being in clubs all around the world is you can be in indigenous house and go on the dance floor and me being an anthropologist of the dance floor, I'd like to think about how deep in detail it is. You'll find that the people from Detroit tend to dance together, even though they don't know each other. The people in LA will dance together. The people in New York will dance together. The people in Chicago, they just tend to find their tribe on the dance floor. And with real house people, they're very territorial. When they're on the dance floor, it's so important. If you go to a regular club, especially now, they want to sit and they want to talk. A real house party, they're on the dance floor from beginning to end. And that's why we're very proud at Indigenous House, as we call ourselves a marathon. Starts at 10, 
it starts at 12 o'clock and it ends at 10 at night. So that's like a good 10 hours of nonstop. And we usually have people who get there at about, actually about eight or nine in the morning, but they're ready for that first beat that hits at noon and they want to see who can make it to the end. Mm, mm. When was the party started? We started in 2009. That was the first indigenous house and our opening act. And it was really the first time. I have to say, if you want to go back to the first say, I have to go back to what really started indigenous house. I had a friend who was a DJ, uh, famous named Kevin Hedge in, in New York. Mm -hmm. And they were doing a thing they just started in New York called Soul Summit. Mm -hmm. And I was up at a Soul Summit with Kevin Hedge, and he told me, well, when we're doing this here, it's about 10 grand to do this. It was just at Fort Green Park out mm -hmm. down in Brooklyn. And I say, for 10 grand, do you know what I could do in Atlanta? Because that was, you know, that's New York. I, said, I came back and I said, well, we can do this here. And I started first with a group called Greenhouse. But Greenhouse just did not have the same vision as I did. When you get to the house music with me, I like to think of, I'm like Hitler. I want world domination. I want everyone to know and feel what house is. I'm not selfish. I want them to feel that freedom. Because you know what's inside that freedom, don't you? Mm. You don't know what's inside the freedom of house? Explain it to folks. That's the security of being self sufficient. When you really find people who are freedom and house, they really are comfortable with the next person. That's what house, when they say the freedom is, they're comfortable to be around everyone. It's always like to think modern day, it's, it's like a woke party. We believe in diversity, equality, and inclusion. I like every different kind of person at a party from one end of the spectrum, because everybody got a little bit of all of them in there. And they're always tend to mixture. And that's where the energy and excitement, if you have all the same type of people at a party, it's gonna bore you. It's not gonna have the excitement and the energy. It's just the difference between the ages and the different parts where their background comes from. That's where the excitement is. I got you, I got you. Do you, who are the DJs at Indigenous House? Well, the first ones was Kevin Kelly and DJ Ron Pullman. That was 2009. Mm -hmm. But as we've grown, we've, it's got to be a very, very sought after uh, gig that a lot of the DJs want to do, want. Everyone wants that because I, I knew that earlier that I could put together the most exciting crowd to dance for house music. And I, we're not the biggest festival out there, but we'd like to think that we're one of the most exciting ones. Excellent. And when is this year's event? We are the third Sunday of May. This year, it's May 21st. Okay. And then given that this is a free party, I guess the two-part question, how do you make your money back? And if you're not, it's not about making money, what is your intention? Well, it, that is a good point there uh, because it is a free party. Uh, and part of it is I want it to be, it to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted everyone to be there. Now, it has become... As somewhat of a problem as it has to be, you have to do the paperwork, you have to do the business, and it has grown. Well, it used to be a party where I could do it for five or ten thousand dollars, like I said initially. That's not the case anymore. We start off with these here. We have uh, these little bands that we have here. We call support bands. They usually start the drive th this month as we start. They're usually about $10. We get some people who do 10, they do 20. And we have a real supportive community because a lot of people in Atlanta feel like this is more than music. It's their legacy, it's their life. And um, it's a great time for community to come together. It's always like people who thought they didn't, uh, people had moved or passed away. And they say, oh, well, you still live in an indigenous house. And even though it is challenging, You'll always find someone at the who come 
and they'll come up to you and say, this is why you do this. Because I had one guy who told me he has been spending the time taking care of his mother and his grandmother. And a friend said, well, you need to come to the park. You need to come to this party. And he came there and he came and told me, he says, I've been seeing you around. And he said, but you know what? All I do is go to work and take care of my mother and my grandmother. You've made me realize I need to start. I have life in me and I need to live my life. And I realized he really meant that, you know what? I still can get up and do quite a bit. Amen. Amen to that. Let's go back to the beginning. What does house music mean to you? It means a whole lot. It's it's what's going to get me through. It defines me who I am. Um, unlike most people, I always say I don't have a choice. Um, my mother was in a Pentecostal church when she went into labor with me and she was shouting and I've been shouting ever since. So I don't have a choice. <laughs> I feel you. How does house music make you feel? It makes me feel like not only that I'm free, it makes me feel like I'm powerful. It feel, makes me feel like I'm in control. A good party and a good run on the dance floor will have you feeling in ways that you never thought you could do. It's the ultimate high. And I think you should be added to the one thing I would say in my travel, which is different about the hardcore house heads. And the reason probably why it's fundamentally difficult to get a house club is they usually drug free. Mm -hmm. All they want is a dark room and the beat. So it's mm -hmm. not really um, profitable now that we don't have the volume to do house heads because all they want is a couple, you know, a couple bottles of water and they good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, which was the, the original clubs were juice clubs where you played in the cover. And all you did was drink juice and um, fruit all night. That was the warehouse. And I'm one of those people who come out the warehouse. I'm one of them Frankie Knuckles kids. No, Make no apologies for it. I'm 306 South Jefferson. Tell us, that's a great segue. Tell us, tell people who Frankie Knuckles is and his importance. Describe how you discovered the warehouse and describe the first time going into the warehouse. What did you see? What did you hear? What did you do? How did you feel? What did it sound like? Paint the picture for somebody that never experienced that. Well, you just walked into, before you got to the warehouse, and that's how Indigenous House is, it's very important to fill it before you get in. That's one of the true criteria of being in a house club. You can feel the beat. You don't know what it is. When you're in line, when you get in there, you can feel it. Before you just walking up the steps at the warehouse, coming in, there's always a group of people and you can just feel it like you knew that you was going in a place where it was going to be free and you was going to have a good time. And when you got into the warehouse, that was back when they was, before there was the jack thing, there was the thing called pumping. And they used to punk. And they used to punk, which was just moving your head out. And who could punk out? It was like the original slam dance before it got commercial. But that's what that Rue Chicago um, Jack slash punk era. But when mm -hmm. you got into the warehouse, you can just spill it. And the first floor, when you just walked in, it was more of an entry level because it was three, it was three, three different levels of it, you know. The third floor is where I think that more the cooling out. But what I think was really, really interesting about the warehouse, because remember, Chicago's not a warm city, so it can be cold, especially in the winter. You'd get there at about four or five o'clock in the morning, six o'clock. Frankie used to have these windows that he would open. He'd roll them up and the windows would open and you could just feel the smoke coming out there, just the sweat and the heat that was coming out there. And that's when he would just drop it down. Frankie also had a very unique way of dropping, um, of slowing the music down. He would, all, instead of like they would pay, um, he'd always play for record from beginning to end, but what he would slow down, he would not be on pitch. He would always slow it two or three down. 
because you'd get a harder, bigger base. Unlike they did, because we didn't have the equipment that we have now. So you could just feel that base and it would just go through you. Boom, boom, boom. And it would come through you and you could feel it. That was the warehouse when you got in there. And again, you could tell the people who were there because everybody knew, most of the people knew each other. And it was a real community and a family. Robert something, I forgot his last name. He used to run it. And you could just tell that you felt like you was in safe. You knew you was in a safe zone when you were there. Describe the crowd, white, black, mixed, what? During that time, it was exclusively black, but it was more of a multicultural crowd. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really open there, but it was predominantly African-American. How often were you a regular at the warehouse? Uh, I was a DJ, and I remember leaving St. Louis because I used to spend it a happy hour and go right into the warehouse. I'd leave probably about 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock, I'd get straight to Chicago, four hours drive, and then by uh, 2.30 or 3 o'clock, I was on the dance floor. We'd be coming out at 11.30 or 12. Back in those days, it was not a good party until you saw the sunlight. If you didn't see daylight, it wasn't a party. Mm. And then talk to us, were there any rituals after the party? Would you go to sleep? Would you all, would everybody get together and go to breakfast? Uh, not at the warehouse because we was too tired there. No, no. I don't never remember doing that. When I can remember clubs, we used to do that like in, in Chicago, that they closed at three, four, five, four, five o'clock. But back then, you know, we really had the true after hour clubs. Breakfast was not that popular. Mm. Not on the East Coast. In Chicago. And describe Frankie Knuckles as a DJ. What was his special talent or skill? What made him so unique? Frankie Knuckles is still the only DJ I would know who would play the first beat of a record and he played the last beat of it. He could sell a record from beginning to end. I always think the famous way <laughs> uh, story, I was over in London. That's when he was in Europe. And he was playing at a club in Brixton called Camden Palace. And uh, I'm just up there, you know, I was in the States then. It was like my second or third time in London. And, you know, London's like considered, I don't know, at that time, it wasn't considered the world's great house town like it is now. But it was a great house town. And I'm at this little party. And Brixton is like the African-American part of London at that time. And uh, I was just there dancing and screaming there. So afterwards, I went up to Frank and he says, I knew I knew that scream from the warehouse. <laughs> Either, I ain't heard a thing you and why. It was just so funny for him to remember me because I used to be one of them ones that could scream for hours and yell for hours and hours. Like I'm more famous now for the whistles. But I, it was me and that screaming back then. If you wasn't screaming all day, you wasn't dancing. You know, you could just walk in and you could just feel it. Because that's when, that's, more so when Ron Hardy, unlike now, you used to have Ron Hardy and Andre Hatchett used to be at the power plant. There was another club in Chicago, but they would be DJs. It was not the camaraderie that we have in DJs today. Back then, the DJs supported each other from beginning to end. They would be out there dancing on the stage, supporting them the whole time because they were just glad to be hearing that music. Mm. Unlike now, was you have a lot of guys, if you're spinning records now, they right behind you like, okay, I'm just, I could do a better job than you. It wasn't that type of that. It was much more supportive. It was definitely more warmer than it is today, you know. Paradise Garage. What does it mean to you? No, that's male cheering. I always think I was in this party and where, uh, in, in, uh, where we at the Winter Music Conference. Um, when that was going on good, there used to be a guy named Mel Churn who was the creator of the garage. And um, he used to have this West End Records party. I think it was on a Wednesday. And uh, I'd always go to that and I'd always say, well, Mel, your parties are always so great. And I can remember, I always think that he told me the secret of what it was to make a great party. He said, oh, I don't make the party. It's the people do. It's just my responsibility to make it a safe, supportive environment where they can uh, 
express themselves the way they wish to be. That's my job. They make the party. And that's just such a simple formula. <laughs> it's my job to make sure they know that you're going to take that. Like at an uh, indigenous house, I may always remind people, our VIP section is the dance floor. Mm. You can't purchase it. You just got to be it. People know who's important on the dance floor. You just can't go buy a section and get bottles all night and be important while you're there spending money. The important person is how much energy you give into the dance floor. That's what a, v a real VIP is. Mm. Mm. That's real. Tell us about the first time you went to the Paradise Garage. Well, one time I was in the Paradise Garage. That was back in the days where they had the toss up between um, T. Scott, Larry LeVan, and Andre Collins down at Better Days. And when I was down there, it was that what they had a thing called DMR, Dance Music Report. That was before the Winter Music Conference. And that's when all the DJs and all the artists who was in the dance music, I'd say that was probably my true entry level into um, the house music. And we were there. I was with, um, you may have heard of this artist. Her name is um, Candy J, AKA Sweet Pussy Pauline. Mm -hmm. um, and I was with her and she was performing. And that was my first time. And I, I really didn't know what I was getting into until I got there. And I was just overwhelming. Overwhelmed by what? Well, there was a big party they had. There's a big story that no one really talks about. And I could say that they had what they call a Chicago party at the warehouse, at, 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 the, at the Paradise. So as I said, Chicago kids by nature, and it's no secret, are very game territorial. So what they bought, the state they claim, is they bought their baby powder. So when people got into into the warehouse, into the garage, you could always tell the Chicago people was like, okay, this is my this is my section, and that's what the baby powder is. It's staking your claim, it's staking your space. That's what it really is. It's not just there for people to dance around, but a lot of people just want to know because everybody can dance in baby powder, especially when they had the great shine, made you know, majorly shellac wooden floors back then, but. It was all about staking your claim at the uh, at the uh, garage. Mm -hmm. mm. Interesting. Um, is Candy J still with us? Oh, I can. She's still performing. Yeah, she's still around. She comes down every other year. She okay. comes to Atlanta. Yeah, she's doing well. Doing very well. She's still in Chicago. Okay. Yeah. Tell us about what is Catch One in Los Angeles? Uh, the magic doors. <laughs> I always say when you walk come up the stairs, you got in there and you step that first day and you walked in, you could see our first time you would see so many people where they were just standing there waiting for that um, those lights to go on and go off. That was Billy Long. Mm -hmm. That was the DJ there. People don't really talk about it, but Ron Hardy is the one who made Catch One, who really took it to that national, made it a real, like a real house club. I don't know if you're familiar with Ron Hardy. He was from Chicago. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. People only talk about, remember Ronnie from the music box, or Rich Two Underground, or maybe the uh, La Mirage. But he was a key, he was the one who took Catch One and made it like the great club it was, you know, because I can remember. He used to play, um, oh, that song he used to play, he used to could bring it down a little bit harder. And he's the one who came up with that electronic cross fader, which is with Joe Claus Hill, just dropping the bass or EQ and it there. Mm -hmm. That was a Ron Hardy thing that he did at the catch. People don't really realize that the catch was probably one of the first clubs that had that. Okay. Wow. But the catch was a fantastic club. It had one of the greatest dance floors you can have. And you just felt so much freedom when you got there. And that's where 
people, I always said LA kids were never dancing. They were always auditioning. Oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> Tell us about your journey as a DJ. What is your intention when you DJ? Well, my when I started DJing, it was for the love of music and the expression. My reason for DJing has changed a lot now. I really only DJ because people, the music has just changed so much and that's the whole purpose of DJs. I see uh, the whole idea of a DJ used to be was to educate people and as Frankie said, is to give them a good time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't for me to be the baddest DJ it is, and I have to show that you're going to play this new banging track that I made eight hours ago that no one's never heard, and you should feel it because I did it. Right. You know, which is not working. It's not working the way it is now. I think a lot of the music we have now, I think it's just like paper towels. You play it one time and throw it away. But uh, this time in the last few weeks, I was looking for an artist, and there are really no artists that you could uh, book right now because... There are no vocals and we don't have anyone. Uh, the, a lot of people, some people say the pandemic and the festivals have been really straining on developing artists and for music, but it's just really kind of hard. So as being a DJ now, I'll only spin so I can make sure the crowd can feel the music. Mm. And I offer definitely, as you say, a contrast now between the ages, the older ones want the classics, and some of the new people in the house just want the new tracks. And you, we are not a large enough genre where you can, uh, where they can be divided. So you'll have the parties that are really, really small. So they really are dependent on each other. And the musical part of it now, it's just hard to find music that is catchy enough or sing-alongs because people don't when i was in the music whatever you heard in the club that monday or tuesday you went to the next to the record store to get you know it mm -hmm. used to be every song was eight dollars because you had to buy doubles two singles for 3.99 mm -hmm. now you can download it for free it used to be you'd have to fight but now you have djs that have a could just give you a whole um thumb drive of music. <laughs> you can go be a DJ right now. So it's really hard now, you know, to, uh, to find DJs who play to the crowd. And that's the reason why I came back to DJ. And it's not because I want to DJ or I want to be the power. You know, that's not it. And it's, I never will tell you this here. It's incredibly challenging to do a successful event and DJ simultaneously. You have to have an incredibly supportive staff. And even still, a lot of people are always going to want that DJ or they want you to be where they want you. And you just can't be a DJ. You have to be these people's personal DJ. You have to be there and know them personally, speak to them. They have to feel like they talk to you just like they, they you just can't just be a DJ, the, uh, the maestro up there in the podium and not know the people. That's just not going to work anymore. What are the traits of a successful DJ? One who has a good relationship with his audience. The great DJs, what they do is they develop a relationship with their music. And if they're good, they can take them somewhere on a journey where they didn't expect to do. As a DJ and as a promoter and as an event organizer, to me, the barometer to tell that you were successful when people can tell you the next day, I don't know why I did that. I can't believe I did that. When you know that they've lost control and stepped out of their comfort zone, because you know, we, we do know that that's where the growth is. If everyone's going to be completely uniform and the same way they came in is the same way they left, you failed. You have not did your job. Mm. That's real. How would you describe your DJ style? I would say I'm a classic because I like to start slow and constantly build as the crowd go. And I always like to have a message in my music. I like the, the music to say something. 
It has to have a message for some people to grasp onto. Describe the ideal relationship between DJ and dancer. I found one of your interviews and it's only one person. I, it brings me to mind to that when you say that, and that's David DePino. It was a it was a dance music report, and I walked into tracks, Little Lewis, French Kiss, and he played it. And when the breakdown, the entire floor, it was at least maybe a thousand people, and he had them all laying down flat. That's a DJ with a relationship with it. When you can got everybody to lay on the floor and not standing up. And I saw David DePino do that. I never saw another DJ do that. That's what you have a complete relationship with the audience, where they trust you that much and they are sitting there. You're not only leading them, but the, you, they're telling you where they want to go. Mm. But it takes a great DJ to also realize that. Not a pre-mix played set and hope that the audience is in the same mode that you are. <laughs> It doesn't work that way there. Any great DJ will tell you that the whole relationship is you have to find out who they are, what they're looking for, and what you can give them, and then find a meeting point, and then go that way, and then you slightly take them out of their comfort zone where they want to go. Mm. And that takes time, talent, and education. <laughs> It's not something you can just wake up and do that. You can't get that from being a Facebook or being a Twitch DJ. That's live audience, hard, cool experience. You can only get that from playing a lot of bad nights or, as I say, paying, playing for a living. You have to play for a living, which is different when you're playing for a hobby. Those are two different types of DJs. Oh, explain that further, please. Those that are playing for a hobby are just doing it because they enjoy music and they're doing it. So they can, if it's a bad night, that's on the crowd. And an owner ain't going to have you spending that spending that much. Um, could keep you playing there if you ain't dancing that crowd and you ain't keeping it smoking there. That's a hobby DJ. But if you plan for a living, where you living and you don't play records, it's just like real estate. If you don't sell a house, you don't eat. So you learn how to play that crowd and you kind of give them, give them what they want. And it's an even, a, a even match opposed to what you have now where the DJs are the promoters and the event organizers and they're just paying. So they just tend to play what they want to play because they wrote the check. Mm. So what do you do when you're not DJing? What's your day job? I do work for the VA. I do VA claims. Gotcha, gotcha. Are DJ residencies relevant? I don't hire a DJ, not a residence. So why would I pay $1,000 for you to come from LA and you can't find a place in LA to spend? <laughs> mm. if, if they're not taking care of you, if the people who you live with ain't thrilled about you, why would I want you? <laughs> I mean, if they, if they know you and they live with you, and I know you're trying to get gigs every day, if they rejecting you, why should I accept you? That's real. That's real talk. You know, because I have numerous of DJs who approach me, and I, you know, I usually don't say anything because I'm not trying to be rude. But I'm like, you don't have no gig at home. You know, I had a DJ once that uh, in Atlanta had came up to asking me to spin. And I just thought he was a horrible DJ, but I never told him. I kept it very private and very personal and uh, just was not spinning, but just didn't respond to him. So he asked me, why come one time to spin? I said, well, you've never saw me on your dance floor. So mm -hmm. if I've never been on your dance floor, what would make you think I'd hire you at the biggest gig of the year to me? Mm -hmm. That's real. Who is the heir to Frankie Knuckles? Who's the current version of Frankie Knuckles? Or is there one? You know, I'm good at questions there. And I'm thinking about that. You kind of have me there because I can 
break it down in a lot of people who he's inspired and who he's a part of. Uh, you can say David Morales, because he does have a style that's somewhat like Frankie Knuckles. I can hear that. Then I could say, I wouldn't say Louis Vega because Louis Vega stands on his own, independent of Frankie Knuckles, which mm -hmm. is a real rarity. Uh, Tony Humphreys is major. Probably someone that you'd probably really be surprised. The one who I would say is the closest to Frankie Knuckles would be Francois K. Explain. His approach of doing music from production is always from a ride, a wide scale, and it's more of a funk, soulful bass before it gets out. You know, when you get into the Yaz and the Martin Circus, you know, that's Francois K. You're like, wow, you never, that's, that's a whole way of stepping out of your comfort zone, which a lot of the other ones, you know, people, now tend to look for old productions that do more rehashes, but starting from just groundwork, of, this is me, this is who I am, the, I would say that would be Francois K. By, yeah. Why are there so few DJ residencies today? <laughs> Obvious reason we don't have the clubs and no one wants to talk about the other issue. We're talking now, this is social media. Social media has destroyed all the clubs. Explain. Yeah, there's not a need for you to go out like it used to. There are plenty of people that I can think, the, the city that I can remember the first that I realized that social media had an effect, I was in San Jose, California. And I was there and I'm like, well, this is a big city. It's got to have something going on. And I talked to four or five people in each one. And this was in the 80s, the early 90s. And it seems like the same question was all, well, there's a new chat room. There's a new website. It was never they wanted an interactive experience. It just wasn't available. So now that we've moved to social media, and it's so different because you get so many people we had them damn phones on the dance floor, which I'm sure I'm not the first one to tell you. They surely just changed the whole vibe on the dance floor. You know, the phone, you know. As I always say, you go to a lot of the clubs, a lot of the women, it is, it's so, it's sad, I would say. They'll be bored. They'll take a picture to post right then and there, like they're having a good time, and then go back to, okay. But we just don't have that social interaction today as we did now. The dance floors have gotten smaller and smaller. I can remember I was at a, a club in New Orleans. It was a casino club. And they had these uh, dancers that were on the podiums. And I can literally see that a lot of people felt like, oh, I'm glad this girl is dancing for me, so I don't have to. Mm. Now, the question is, will that return? I don't know. Also, um, the reason why there's a lot of, not a lot of residency for DJs because there's not a lot of clubs. And um, a lot of people, I think, um, I don't know if we'll ever recover from the pandemic. And um, aging out. You know, it's just taking a while. People just, it, it took a while. That was one reason why the festival's done so well over the uh, the clubs, because people didn't want to be inside. Mm -hmm. Now that they get, it's hard to get a lot of a real good party, and you got the people who are in their 50s and 60s, and they just, their life will not allow them to be out weekly. It just doesn't, mm -hmm. you know. And what you tend to find, because I used to, um, I started a business when I was really driven called Postor, point of sale target audio radio. And what that was designed to do in store and um, 
radio stations for small businesses. And it was my objective is I thought I could program two or three house songs <laughs> in smaller markets around there and maybe get some hit and get some leeway so we could grow. But what I learned out of that endeavor was people listen to whatever they like between 18 and 35. Whatever they listen to from 18 to 35, they're probably going to listen to that for the rest of their lives. Mm. So we're, we're at a point now, people just can't go. I can't go out every week. <laughs> I'm not going to go out every week. You know, it's going to, it takes a lot to get me to go out. And, you know, like I, I, my, one of my greatest models, I always tell people, I've been to the mountaintop. I'm just trying to get you there. Mm. Describe the Atlanta house music scene. Diverse, interesting, uh, segregated, um, in different ways. Uh, it's, we have people who want the Afro house. We have people who want the old school only. We have people who want vocals. We want people who want to dance hard. And it's just kind of difficult at times to put a button on which market is really good because we really have some great djs in atlanta and we have a lot of good talent in atlanta but it's just putting them all together at the right time sometimes it's, it's incredible and sometimes it's like we, we got a lot of work to do but it has gotten as we have grown into a bigger more major market um it's not the community is not here as we once was, you know. It was it was usually at one point it was very, very close, but that's just the fact of, you know, we're a big city now, we're, we're a bigger market than it used to be. You know, we used to be geared towards just the um, you know, the black uh schools, the AU center, but now, you know, we have people from all over the country, if not the world here, for one reason or another. The entertainment community, when we went into more of this, the, the Hollywood of the South, that really changed the whole uh, house scene and the whole fabric of the city. It's not the same. How did it, cha how did it change? Well, more people uh, are more seeking for notoriety and fame opposed to just the core of the music and the party. Hmm. And you can usually tell the, you can tell the difference. Mm -hmm. You know, would the Paradise Garage work today? Absolutely not. <laughs> Why not? Because it's a different time. There's only one Paradise Garage. It was the right place at the right time. It met the moment. As Meryl Churin says in this documentary, I always say that at that time New York was going through this big racial reckoning and come to deal with it and his greatest statement was if they dance together maybe they can live together people were willing to dance together and have a great time there they're not really willing to do that now as as they, people are more territorial they're not um you know they're more apprehensive before they express themselves you know and you know we've also you would think that we would now that we're in, um, I don't want to say it, but the post-HIV era, that fear is gone. But it's just a different time right now. And when you're making history like the Paradise was, you're never, ever aware of it. Maybe someone will find another way to make another history and another era, but that era is dead and gone. We can't get it. We cannot have, we can't go back. And that's what getting another paradise would be a step back. You have to respect their time and their day, and you have to have your own day, your own time. Vinyl versus MP3. <laughs> a lot of people like the, uh, what people like about vinyl, myself included, vinyl taught you about the music. The one thing about the vinyl is
you could hold it. You could touch it. You could feel it. That was the greatest thing about an album cover. You could read it. You could sit there and find out everything about every person. That was an educational uh, endeavor of its own. Unlike an MP3, you go through more of them. That's why music is so disposable, it's disposable now. It's just so available. It's just so much of it. You can't, you cannot put all in a funnel. It is. You can, it's a lot of good records, good shit that's out there. But I can remember uh in New it used to be a DJ in New York named Timmy Registry. There was nothing for Timmy Registry to play a record for 10, 12 minutes. After the hot mix five in Chicago, if you play a record more than four to five minutes on a dance floor, that's damn good. The attention span right now is three, about three and a half, four minutes. You got to be moving, bang, 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 bang. That's how it is totally changed right now. Final, if you paid eight dollars for a record, <laughs> you was gonna spend a little bit more time on it than it is now. Then you just do an MP3, which you downloaded one and then you just doubled it for two of them to match it from the equipment. The mm -hmm. quality is better. I do, I do not regret doing those mobiles carrying them damn record crates. <laughs> I have had plenty of years of carrying them record crates. I don't, I don't regret them at all. So there are some advantages. You know, it's like everything. It's pluses and minuses. You have to just make them work for you you know like i have a controller now i used to have um turntables and cdjs the market change mm, change with the times yeah what is soulful house soulful house music that you can feel that talks to your soul. It tells you your life. It tells you what you can go, what you can aspire to be. A lot of the things, you know, in my opinion, this is just my opinion, house people, when we tend to um, uh, grow and we start to lose market share, we start accepting. We have so many derivatives of house now and all of them are not authentic. They're not real. They, they don't stand up for what it is. Soulful house, first of all, it has to have a good, strong vocal. You got to have a Barbara Tucker or a, a India telling you to aspire or even Aretha Franklin to be a better person or something that's happening in your life. You know, Soulful House is what I like to say. A track doesn't mean nothing without a vocal to bring it to life. That's what brings music to life when it has a good vocal. A good soulful vocal that tells you what you should aspire to and what you are. We just don't have that much now. because We have a lot of paper, like I said, it's disposable. You have the one time, it's Monday, Monday afternoon, it's gone. Advice, what advice would you give to the next generation? I'm always challenged with that. Because when I'm at Indigenous House, I always get the next generation coming to me. And I always have to look and step back and thinking, you know, they were just like you. They don't know what's next and they are the energy because they have that invincible mentality that nothing could stop them. Nothing could get in. Nothing's going to get in their way. I would tell them to keep going and find themselves and find who, who they are and what they're looking for and not try to duplicate somebody else because they can never be what I was in the 80s and 90s. They have to be what's happening in 23. Yeah. Because the, for the simple reason, technology allows them to do a whole lot of stuff today that they didn't in the 80s and the 90s when I was clubbing. It's a whole other world now. What inspires you to go out these days, if anything? 
I do go out. There are a few clubs and a few parties in Atlanta that I tend to go to regularly. Uh, Which ones? Huh? Which ones? Uh, we have one thing that's pretty good now. It's the first Friday. It's once a, uh, well, in Atlanta, and it's probably the hottest party in the country for going back to the true original way of house is. Um, there's another one that I like in Chicago called or Smarts on Sundays, uh, the Smart Bar. So there are parties that are that are, uh, inspire me and uh, make me want to get out that I have to go there and I will get a feeling out of it, you know. Um, and I'm one of those people who I can, I enjoy the, the different parties. I, the crowd can be anything. As long as the music is right, I can adjust to that. I can. It does, I have been in some clubs and I was the only one person like myself in there. And if it was a good time and the music was there, I was good. You know, I think that era is kind of gone now. More people are just looking for more uh, notoriety than just going to party. But you know, times are different. You know, but. I do go out and there are parties and there are, there's always going to be parties and festivals that are hold my attention. It's just, you just got to find them. Mm -hmm. But a real house head will go. I went through a dumpster one time and in this club behind, behind heaven in London to get to this club called Bad. There is no distance how far a hardcore house head will go for a party. If it's a good party and they pulling hair there and they feel that they can get that feeling that they're looking for, it's worse than crack. There's nothing going to keep them out of there. Mm. Mm. That's deep. Is there anything that I didn't ask you about house that you want to talk about? Pretty much asked me everything. I uh, was just because you really got into where we're going for house, and that is uh, it's a very delicate but sensitive subject because everyone has their own vision, and I would say most of the people I know that do house, especially who do the events. I may not be thrilled about their event, but I think that there has to be much more respect for a person in different organizations who are successful to get a uh, event off now, because it takes a lot more than it used to. It used to be at old Paris, great, we don't really need a crowd to have a party, just a funky beat. Well, that ain't the case right now. You go through a lot of permits, a lot of club owners, uh, everybody got to get their cut. It's a lot of hurdles to get through a successful party now. It's a lot of hurdles. So you really have to be down for the cause. I have to. I always think about, uh, I was in Baltimore and I was talking to Alton at Tay one time and she said so tactfully, we only do house because it's a labor of love and we love it. It's what we are. If you're doing it for money, you need to go do something else. Mm -hmm. hardcore house heads do it because that's just what they are it's frustrating sometimes I want to say I want to give it up I'm tired of it dealing with the people dealing with the club owners it seems like it takes everything out of you and it seems like it's not enough but what happens at the end of that it's always the music that tells you that pulls you back into it mm -hmm. So it's like, uh, in the word, uh, Carol and Bird told me once we did the, the winter music conference, she said, you know you house for life. You don't have a choice. Mm. <laughs> and when she told me that, I didn't understand it. But I understand it now. You're house for life. You don't, it's not a thing when you're really a hardcore house head. You can, you don't have a choice, you know. We always say it's only like about a couple hundred of us left in the country. It's a lot of people who like house music, but it's a couple hundred who just, you know, we would die without our house. 
and we feel like it's a responsibility to keep it going on mm. in more of its true pure form and mm. that's what i like to think of um indigenous house because if you get to look at that term indigenous we like to think of ourselves as the original house people mm -hmm. we come out of the original house clubs where house clubs was based on just freedom mm. and it was a safe zone for you to express yourself because you really didn't have that option in other venues mm -hmm. that's the one thing that all these clubs have and that goes from new york to la and there's just so many clubs that I can probably tell you that you never thought of from Washington, D.C., you know, um, from the clubhouse or Philadelphia, the catacombs or Baltimore, Odell's or Tracks or Loretta's in Atlanta or the warehouse, the Ritz, LaRay's, the Generator, Todd's, uh, Heaven, the Music Institute. You know, I could just go on the Taste, the Weldon, you know. Um, San Francisco, the, diff the different strokes, you know, they're just clubs that they, but that's safe zone and you can just find them and you can just see the freedom that people had there. They were just so happy, like, oh, at last I'm safe. It's like you came in out the cold. It was like the ultimate comfort zone. Mm. All right. Well, thank you so much. Tell everybody again one more time Indigenous House, the date, the time, I wrote the details. Indigenous House, Atlanta. It's May 24th. We start at noon and we stop at 10. And this year we will be having from San Francisco, David Hornis. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Used to spend at a club called The End Up. I used to always sneak through San Francisco whenever I get out on the West Coast to get there on that little Sunday afternoon party before Body and Soul. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I always try to give the DJs that I think that would have who would find it a challenge, but more so can appreciate where they came from and where we are now. And I think he'd be a good fit for now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Okay, and you have a good day. All right, you too. Take care.